Welcome into the Nike Hot Seat. I'm Emily Eamon chatting with some of our Nike volleyball athletes across the world. We're headed to the men's game this time, and I'm with one of the best, Matt Anderson, Olympic bronze medalist and member of Team USA since 2009. Matt, thank you so much for being here. You know, just in general, I kind of want to talk about your volleyball career first. Of course, you're one of the most well-known volleyball players in the world, especially in the U.S., but I want to take it all the way back to the beginning. When do you remember falling in love with the game? Yeah, shoot. So I didn't. I played other sports growing up. I played basketball, baseball, soccer, traditional kind of stuff. Um, I got into volleyball when I was 15 to like actually start playing 14, 15, my freshman year in high school. And I fell in love with it pretty much right away. Um, my sisters, a couple of my older sisters played uh, in club and then into college. And so I got to go, being from New York, I got to go to Penn State for the girls east coast championships I'm not sure if they're still held there but they were at that point in time and it was just so cool so my first experience seeing a club tournament and then also being on a college campus and it was it was just really fun and being the youngest of the, of the five kids from my family i had to go everywhere <laughs> so they weren't they weren't leaving me at home alone yet and so uh i got it was it was cool it was a really big opening into a great sport like a lot of younger athletes, you know, everyone, especially, you know, a few years ago, you're able to play pretty much every sport. I'm wondering, growing up in upstate New York, where did volleyball fall in the sports landscape? It actually was pretty prevalent for, for boys up there. Um, I mean, the hard thing was we play in the fall in New York for boys volleyball. So boys and girls play at the same time. Um, so it wasn't like... I want to say it was as intense of a sport. It wasn't really followed that much, but it had its cult following and um, it's only grown. And I was luckily to, lucky to pay, play for one of the better clubs in the area, Eden Volleyball Club. And actually Aaron Russell, who's another Nike guy and, and national team guy, his wife, Kendall, his father was the club director and one of my coaches. So uh, it's a cool little connection there, but, my grandfather played in the senior Olympics and then my aunts and uncles played growing up. And then of course my sisters. So it's pretty prevalent in the area. It's like I said, it's got this little cult following and, and there's a couple D three schools in the area that were always, you know, the local high school stars would go there if they didn't go on to play D two or D one. Yeah, you went on and played at Penn State and had an awesome career helping lead your team to an NCAA title in 2007. You're named national player of 2008. the 2008, 2008. Yeah. I know after that, you decided to forego your senior season and end up playing in Korea that year. Why did you decide to do that? Yeah, so I was at um, I was at kind of a crossroads um, trying to figure that out because Penn State at that point, it was, it was really weird. So volleyball for me, most of my steps have kind of been like, okay, I'm done. What do I do now? Like after high school, I didn't really know like, okay, maybe I could go play at a D2 school, D3 school and, you know, get my teaching degree and then become a teacher. And then like out of the blue, Penn State came around and I was like, okay, cool. I'll go there, you know, and then I'm playing at Penn State and I'm still playing like youth and junior national teams, but I wasn't expecting to make it to the big team. And, and definitely wasn't expecting to play professionally right out the gate. Like it was deep in the back of my mind, like possibility, but it wasn't like, this is going to be my main, like my main focus, like going forward. And so it was a surprise. And I was like, well, luckily we just won the championship that year in 2008. Um, and I won all the personal accolades for that year that you could essentially um for my position i should say and then i was like well i don't know I'm, I'm on a good scholarship but i'm still paying to go to school i have a chance to go play professionally something that most athletes dream of growing up and granted it was volleyball i was thinking i was going to be playing for the yankees at some point but <laughs> um i i wanted to give it a shot because school is gonna, always going to be there kind of thing and if i don't know if this opportunity to play professionally is going to be there so Ultimately, it came down to that, and so it was great. I played a great first season, and I was able to pay off all my student loans, and then 
you know, I went back the next season to the same team and then um, I just kind of kept going and I just kept going through the doors that were opening for me and I'm still doing that. I'm still here. I'm still kind of just rolling with it. Still here, definitely still doing it. You mentioned, obviously, you know, playing professionally in Korea. You've been in Italy, China, Russia, all around the world. What's the biggest thing that you've learned from living in all these different places and traveling so much? Yeah, well, it's definitely confirmed to me that I, I love being American and I love being from America. Uh, but it's definitely opened my eyes to seeing America from an outsider's perspective, getting to know people more. Um, knowing that, you know, I'm, I'm always going to come back here and I'm always going to have a home here, but being able to see our country from an outsider's perspective and just to get a little bit more empathy and sympathy and, and, and the way, you know, international politics and international news and can work, but also that people are people. You know, is we might have grown up in very different scenarios, different even throughout the states. I mean, geez, mm -hmm. but throughout the world, we all kind of want the best thing for our families and for our loved ones, and that's all to be successful and and happy in the way that you know we can be to the fullest. And uh, I think that's yeah, probably my number one takeaway from it. On top of you know, great competition experience and and that kind of stuff like that comes along with being an athlete, you know. Yeah, definitely. You know, throughout the years, you can see, you know, the growth, I feel like for people that play professionally, not just as a player, but as a person being more cultured, more well-rounded, you've now been playing pro for what, about 15 years. In terms of the men's game, you talked about how it kind of, you know, grow and is growing in, in New York where you're from, but what's the biggest way that you've seen the men's game grow over your time in the sport? Oh, geez. I think, well, when I came on to the international scene, the back row pipe, the BIC has been the biggest, that was like the biggest leap at that. I mean, Dante from Brazil, I remember watching YouTube videos of him just bouncing balls on people and being like, that was so amazing. Hoping that I could maybe do that one day. And, you know, then I started doing that in college and it was like, it was, you had to have a BIC to keep your offense balanced in the international game. And, you know, luckily our team here with Team USA is like arguably the best big hitting team in the world. So I fit into it really well. And then, you know, after the 2016 games or sorry, the 2012 games, Clay Stanley started having some injuries and we didn't really have an opposite that could take over that spot. And so I was asked to move to the right. And what it did was it essentially made like three outside hitters on the court. And I think that is, you're starting to see some pro teams do that. Uh, and, and like Trento is an Italian club, one of the best Italian clubs. And they're doing it. They've been doing it for a couple seasons. And there's a couple of national teams that have moved outside hitters to the opposite position. And I think that will be the next progression in that. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but <laughs> that's my, my natural, like, thought process of what the natural the next progression in, in the men's game will be i mean speed power we're always going to have that we're going to have guys serving at 80 something miles an hour and guys jumping out of the gym but as a, a whole system i think that's the next kind of natural progression yeah there's of course been so many progressions on the court and i kind of want to look off to the court now i mean the fan support of the men's game has you know exploded over the past few years and really the last decade or so and i got to see it firsthand in anaheim seeing so many fans coming to your usa games but also a lot of fans supporting these other teams there in your opinion how does fan support compare now to where it was when you first started playing professionally yeah. Um, well, social media is huge with that. I think just being able to reach fans and let them know that, hey, we're playing here. You know, like, I know you're a fan of volleyball. Like, maybe you might actually want to come see it play at its highest level to understand, like, just where we are. I think that's the biggest disconnect about having a professional league in the, here in America is mm -hmm. we fans of the sport are forced to be watching stuff overseas. And if you can watch it in person, you actually – feel the energy in that gym and, yeah. and can put a little bit more to like when guys are serving that hard and spiking that hard, jumping that high, like what it actually looks like in person. Like everyone can see that on NBA games and NFL games um, and for the women's side as well. But 
uh, it, it opens your eyes to a whole different world of what volleyball can be. Um, we have a big beach circuit here in the States and that's prevalent and people watch it and they understand it. And, but volleyball is such a cool sport, I think, because it can translate across all skill levels. Like you played at a family barbecue and then you also can play it in the Olympics like that. There's a pretty big discrepancy in skill level, but the fun that you can get out of it and, and the fulfillment of playing a sport is it's right there. Yeah. I think men's volleyball, especially, I mean, you know, I've, I've covered the game for a bit now and watching men's volleyball in person is completely, it's a completely different experience than watching it on TV. I don't think it translates necessarily as well because when you're there, you see how high these guys are jumping. You really see how hard they're hitting and serving. And I think that's something really unique to the men's game that if you can get to a game in person, it is mind blowing. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, volleyball world has been doing a great job with their promotions through BNL and and just the the ability to slow things down and getting good commentators that are explaining it for the layman for the most part what is happening and then getting the slow motion animations after the fact and you know like kind of like how tennis does the shots in and out and then I think I remember back to like when I was growing up in Buffalo and watching ice hockey um, and they it was so fast that you couldn't really tell what was happening and then they started highlighting the puck on the on the ice for people to see it just so. If you're because you're at home, you can't really follow it that fast because it's, it's just moving all over the place. And I think that's what's kind of a, a big disconnect in the men's book game is because it's so fast. It's like boom, boom, boom. Okay, what happened? Okay, whoa, they're already on to the next play. Like you need somebody that a commentator that is able to connect those dots for people. And I think they're doing a good job with that. Yeah, I know. Switching gears. You've had an incredibly long career. You've played all over the world. I know at times you've debated debated whether you wanted to continue. And I know after Tokyo, there were questions of if you were going to get to Paris three years later, which would make your fourth Olympic appearance. And, you know, of course, if your team qualifies, you will be there. How long do you anticipate playing for? Yeah, um, if you would ask me a couple of years ago, for sure, Paris <laughs> would have been the end of the road. Um, I don't know. I'm not putting a, a complete nail in the coffin after Paris. I, it's just going to come down to whether or not it's the best option for me and my family. Yeah. Um, I got two kids now with my wife and, um, we may be having more soon. We don't know. And it's, it, there's just, there's a lot that we have to put into the equation. I mean, yeah. we're not from California where we train with the national team and we're obviously not from where we're playing overseas because we don't have a professional league here. So we're, we're moving all over the place. Moving a family is a lot harder than <laughs> moving a single person around. And um, so, yeah, I don't know, as long as it's still worth it in the long run for us as a family, as a single unit, I don't see why I would stop. I mean, I'm, I think I'm still playing at a high level and able to help the team. Um, I don't know. I can't, can't sign on for LA 2028. That's a little too far away to, to really know how things are going to be, but it's not completely out of the question. Definitely makes sense. I One of the things that I, I really admire about you and your story is you've always been really open about the ups and downs in your career, You know, especially how mental health has played a big role in your life as a professional athlete and bringing just a little bit more awareness to that. Why has it been so important to you throughout the years to really be open with what what's going on with you and, and your career and, and family and everything? Well, I think there's a human aspect to all of us. We, we are people and we have feelings and emotions and things that, you know, as an athlete in these Olympic competitions and qualifications and just our general competition, there's a level of stress and that we're dealing with day in and day out, even through trainings. And if you don't allow, or if you're not getting that release from your sport or from your career, it has to go somewhere. And my problem was being okay saying it, like just getting it out. And once I was able to get it out, then I was like, okay, I feel incredibly better, like so much better that, why didn't I just start doing this a long time ago? And and it, sure, there's stigmas to it. And, and there's different sports and different careers that maybe you can't be as open with that. But you also don't have to be 
active in social media posting about it or doing interviews about it, as long as you have somebody or whether it's a professional therapist or just a person in your life that you can just say what you want to say, say like, get it out, get it. You know, I like to put it to something tangible. So I like to journal about it so that it's actually there and I can touch it. I can feel it. I can read it. And I'm putting worth to my thoughts and feelings. And then I'm able to put it aside and, and go forward. I think that it's all part of the human experience we're trying to be and what we're trying to accomplish. And again, with sports, we at the highest level, we have to, we're risking failure every time we're on the court. And that's the hardest thing for me to get over is somebody's going to walk away from this match, a winner and a loser. Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes the odds are in your favor. Sometimes they're not, but the end of the day someone's going to win someone's going to lose and you have to deal with that and so the glory of winning an olympic medal is immense but what's even more so is the failure of not winning one and and dealing with that um and having a a, a support system or a, a just a system in place where you can explore those emotions without judgment without fear um, I think it's only made me a better person and a better volleyball player. Yeah. It's been so great over really just the last few years to see some of these high level athletes and really high profile athletes be so open about it and are one mm -hmm. willing to talk about it and two knowing when they also need to take a break. And like you mentioned, that's not just, you know, openly talking about it in interviews, posting about it, but really doing that work for themselves whether that's to get back out on the court or not, but just to be a better person and, and to feel better in and out. I'm wondering from your perspective, for younger players coming up through the game, no matter what sport it is at any level, what would your biggest piece of advice be for them if they are struggling with something? Um, well, first, like, yeah, I think I have a couple of things, but first would be just to explore all the possibilities. Don't shut it down in a way that I mean, like, it, it doesn't have to be talking with someone, but it could be starting a journal. It doesn't have to be a journal if you don't like to do that, you know, or because you know, whatever that stigma, it could be a diary, right? Like whatever, it doesn't matter. I don't, I do write just, I write my dreams down sometimes because it's something that is stuck in my head and I have a hard time understanding if it's reality or not. So I just like to get it out, but it don't, um don't put negativity in your brain because your body your brain can't process that like it doesn't process don't be mad it just like i'm not mad well you are mad like because your brain can't understand that negative thing like don't miss well it's gonna now it's focusing on you missing you know like that kind of stuff so don't put it in a negative limelight put it in a way of this is only gonna help me when it, it's hard it's emotions it's introspection and it's self-reflection, it's self-criticism, it's self-judgment that you have to be able to go through so that you can come through at the end you know, a much better and much refined person, athlete, professional, whatever it is you do. Yeah, and I, I like that advice too of, you know, try journaling. If that works for you, great. If it doesn't, you can switch to something else. There's so many mm -hmm. tools and tips out there that you can, you know, try out. Again, if you don't like them, you can scrap them. Um, yeah. I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. We've talked about qualifiers now a few times. I know you guys are headed um, out to Japan, I believe, in a few weeks. What do we need to know about this Team USA squad? We got a glimpse of, of what you guys can do in the VNLs, but what are we looking forward to for qualifiers? Yeah, well, the qualifiers tough. It's We play, what is it, seven matches in nine days. So it's like two matches, day off, two matches, day off, three matches. And, you know, like most tournaments these days, they don't make it easy on us athletes and it, because we just don't have the time, I guess. But the, I think what you're going to see from us is just a well-rounded team where we had a great VNL in a lot of ways. Yes, we wish we won, uh, but we're taking those matches and trying to build off of it to put ourselves in the best position to win this Olympic qualification tournament. We have a North Seca event before. But this the Olympic qualification is that's this summer. That's the main event for the summer for us. And so we're we're gearing up to be the best we can at that tournament 
against those opponents. And uh, we fully expect to leave that tournament with an Olympic qualification certificate. Yeah, it's good to hear. And I think from what we saw from this team at VNL, you guys are well more than capable of doing it. And obviously just so fun to watch and, and follow along. And I kind of want to put volleyball to the side now because mm-hmm. I was told you're quite the handyman and really into woodwork. So I want to know how you possibly got into that. Well, I'm not um, in, in a lot of ways. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a, a woodworker, but um, I like being able to fix things around the house. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't like having to call somebody if my door is loose or if a drawer doesn't work or the toilet's stopped or sink is clogged. Like, I like to be able to fix that stuff. I don't always have the time, um, but that's the type of house I grew up in. So my dad fixed everything at the house. And, you know, if we needed another room because another kid came around, we made a, a house addition. And, <laughs> and so, but that's a lot of my family, um, have those type of careers but they're blue collar jobs whatever you want to call them tradesmen they're um so there was always someone in the family that knew how to do something so if you know my a couple of my uncles were electricians and they would come over and help my dad wire you know a new outlet or a light switch or if we got a new fan like that kind of stuff but um i don't know it's always interested me and it's, it's something that i potentially we'll get into when I retire um, from playing volleyball because I get a lot of satisfaction and fulfillment out of being able to fix something and know that I did it because it's something that we're using every day. Like if I didn't fix this, it would be broken and we wouldn't be able to use it. Or if, you know, my wife and I want to do a little house project because we want something, a deck or whatever it is, like we're going to use this deck. And every time we use this deck, I'm going to know that I did it, you know, and, if it fails, then I have only me to play for it. But, you know, you live and learn. You rebuild it, you know, that kind of stuff. What's the biggest project that you've worked on? Um, Gosh, it's nothing big. I, I built my own workbench at, at my, my wife's house in Indiana. So, I don't yeah. know. I have tools on it. And then, like, we have a barn there. So, uh, we got married in the barn. And it had uh, a couple stable rooms. So, it wasn't actually me building something, but I demolished it. I took it took it apart, which was pretty freaking hard. But just like it was nice stress relief, taking a sledgehammer and saws all to some walls and stuff. But yeah, I love that. That's awesome. The, quite the renaissance, man. You can truly do it all. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, it's been it's been awesome getting to catch up and really dive into, you know, your volleyball career and um, some thoughts on other things and and talk about that, uh, that bench you got in, in the bar. Yeah. Matt, thank you. Thank you so, so much for joining me. This is awesome. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you.